today's topic is caring for the caregiver, effective stress management strategies. We chose this topic today with all of the dedicated caregivers in our community in mind, as well as November being Caregiver Awareness Month, which I still can't believe November starts next week. So we wanted to give our community some ideas and strategies that they can start implementing all month long during Caregiver Awareness Month. When it comes to something like a cancer diagnosis, no one is really prepared to step into the role of a caregiver. The diagnosis, like the new role of caregiving, is often shocking and can be overwhelming. We hope through today's presentation, you're able to take away some strategies that you can implement into your routine to help ensure you are being taken care of while you provide the incredibly important role of caring for your loved one. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for this special topic, Dina Smith. Dina is a licensed oncology social worker and the caregiver program coordinator at Cancer Care. With extensive experience in providing emotional and practical support, Dina facilitates both in-person and online support groups for caregivers. She offers counseling to individuals coping with cancer, those caring for loved ones with cancer, and those grieving a loss. Dina is dedicated to developing and implementing educational programs that empower and support cancer caregivers. I'm, so, I'm sure you can see why we're excited to have her talk on this topic with us today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to her. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to go ahead and share my screen. And let me put it into a presentation mode. All right, perfect. Um, so I preface by saying um, sometimes my Wi-Fi is fantastic. Sometimes it decides to not work with me at uh, the worst moments. So bear with me if I'm a little slow or if uh, my computer is delayed at all, but I think that we're good to go. Uh, Mary graciously introduced me. Uh, my name is Dina Smith. I am an oncology social worker working at the nonprofit Cancer Care. Uh, I am the caregiver program coordinator there. So in addition to my role of uh, counseling patients, caregivers, and those who are bereaved, I design and facilitate workshops specifically for the caregiver population. Um, so today, as Mary uh, mentioned, I'm going to be talking about stress management for caregivers. But even if you're a patient, this will still be relevant for you as well. You'll learn a lot. Maybe you'll be able to take some things back to whomever caregives for you. But you'll be able to also you'll also be able to incorporate a lot of these things into your own mindfulness practice. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today's learning objectives. The workshop today aims to identify the definition of caregiving, understand the roles and responsibilities surrounding caregiving, identify symptoms of burnout, and last but not least, to identify self-care practices in order to alleviate burnout. So let's just start with the basics. What even is a cancer caregiver? How do you define that? So anyone providing care to a loved one can be considered a caregiver, although not everyone defines what they are doing as caregiving. So we, let's break it down a little bit. You could be a long distance caregiver, meaning you take care of someone who isn't even in the same household or in the same town. Yes, you can be a caregiver to someone who lives 30 minutes away, an hour away, across the state, across the country, across the world. You could be local, so you may be uh, taking care of someone within your same household or within, you know, a five mile radius. You may provide more emotional support, such as uh, lending an ear so your loved one can vent or uh, a shoulder to cry on. Or you may provide more practical support, meaning you transport your loved one to and from doctor's appointments, you uh, figure out finances, you are uh, taking care of household chores more than you used to. Uh, you may be a family member to uh, your loved one, or perhaps you're even a friend or a neighbor. And let's not forget that healthcare professionals do also count as caregivers. So as you can see there, this list pretty much um, you know, shows that everyone can be a, a caregiver. Um, it just is based off of your definition of what's valid to you, and that definition belongs to you. 
So if someone were to come to you and say, eh, I don't, I don't know if you're a caregiver, you're only like partially helping out your loved one, or you only call so often. No, you still are helping by calling, checking in, even if it's one task, even if it's 20 tasks, you are defined as a caregiver. So let's talk about some of the responsibilities. Um, as I was mentioning, you got emotional responsibilities versus physical responsibilities. That's the practical and emotional support. And you don't have to be in one column or another. You can be one quarter emotional, three quarters physical, or one quarter physical, three quarters emotional. Again, the definition is unique to you. But uh, some of the physical responsibilities, the main ones that I see that caregivers uh, help out with a lot are transportation. So driving your loved one to and from doctor's appointments or setting them up with transportation services, attending to household chores, making meals, uh, assisting with ADLs. That stands for activity of daily living. So think about the things that sometimes we take for granted, bathing yourself, clothing yourself, washing the dishes, things like that. Administering medications. Absolutely, a caregiver may have to take on uh, nursing responsibilities of administering certain medications to their loved one at home. You may be the organizer, scheduler, scheduling medical appointments, because as I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, a lot of appointments go into, um, into your oncology care, of course. And last but not least, advocating for your loved one. Uh, asking questions um, towards the medical team, maybe asking questions after hours through that portal or through the, uh, the after hours hotline. And then of course we move over to the column of emotional responsibilities. So maybe you're the type of caregiver who is really good at just checking in, seeing how your loved one is doing. Maybe you lend a really good listening ear. Maybe you provide a really good shoulder to cry on, uh, allowing them to vent or, you know, express their true emotions. Uh, perhaps you check in uh, with a phone call, email, or text. Uh, maybe you are being vocal about or sitting with uh, your own feelings. So a lot of times uh, the patient, particularly with patients who have caregivers who live in the same household as them, patients want to know how you as the caregiver are feeling. So uh, it's really honestly healthy if the caregiver uh, expresses, you know, hey, this is really stressful for me too, because shows that you're human and it shows that, you know, you're kind of in this together. You're in the same boat. While the patient has their own stressors, you too have your own stressors. And last but not least, advocating for your loved one. So you can see advocating for your loved one can be both a physical and an emotional responsibility. And so let's talk about some of the challenges. I know we've already kind of covered a little bit of the general challenges, but now I'm going to hone in on specific challenges that I find that certain populations face. Um, so specifically when you're caring for a partner, so your partner, your spouse, your partner, your significant other, um, when you're caring for that person who has cancer. So you'll see that in the next few slides, including this one, I've highlighted at the top the bold ones, which is the stressors that I find are unique to this particular caregiver population. And then the ones on the bottom can kind of, uh, you know, I've seen have been uh, stressors for people who care for all sorts of people. But so let's go into the detailed ones surrounding the unique stressors of caring for a partner. Um, so I and a lot of other social workers have found that intimacy during and after treatment is a big challenge. Uh, this is particularly seen in um, the young adult population, which uh kind of coincides with the fertility concerns. Um, this is a very unique issue that a lot of uh, YA, young adult people face. At least they're more vocal about it. But of course, you can have intimacy and fertility issues at any single age if you are dealing with a cancer diagnosis. You got to think about preserving eggs, prefer, uh, preserving sperm, thinking about lower libido. What does that look like? Maybe meeting with a counselor, a social worker, or talking with your doctor uh, to address those concerns. That's extremely important domestic responsibilities as well. So if you're living in the same household, um, 
you know, you might have to pick up some of the responsibilities that your loved one used to do. So for instance, if it was 50-50, maybe your loved one would vacuum and you would do the dishes. Perhaps you're vacuuming, doing the dishes, picking up the children, and you're also uh, doing so many more things for the household. In addition, co-parenting might look very different now. So for instance, uh, you might have to um, take on more of the responsibility of uh, taking your kids to and from extracurricular activities, school, um, uh, religious meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So as you can see, a lot of times we see that partners, um, particularly the balance are, there really is no balance anymore because uh, the person who's going through treatment probably has to rest, doesn't have a lot of energy anymore, maybe is in the hospital a little more. So the caregiver who is the other partner has to take on more responsibility. And this can be really difficult. But so beyond that, there are, of course, many other challenges such as managing work or school with cancer treatment. Uh, a partner may feel isolated. They may feel unable to physically and emotionally connect with others of similar age. Uh, you may have challenges with engaging in self-care, uh, which we will go into a little more in future slides. Uh, you may have increased feelings of resentment. I know that this is a really um, taboo thing to talk about. How can a caregiver feel resentful of their loved one um, when they're not the one going through cancer? But it can happen. It's a very normal feeling. Um, and it's important to identify it, not be ashamed of it, but address it in a way where um, you can alleviate it and you can ensure that the resent uh, the resentment doesn't boil over where you're starting to get into more arguments with your loved one. Perhaps you're grieving the life that you had pre-cancer diagnosis. And on the opposite end, maybe you have, you're experiencing anticipatory grief, which is grieving the future life that you had planned. Maybe you planned a, maybe you had a specific retirement plan with your loved one, and now that is no longer because of this cancer diagnosis. Or maybe you were family planning, and that is no longer, or maybe it just looks differently because of the cancer diagnosis. So there are many things that we can grieve from the past and many things that we can grieve of the life that we had planned. And caring for a parent, it looks similar, but it also looks different. So we also, we find that uh, a big challenge when caring for a parent is this uh, aspect of role reversal, which is a situation in which two people have chosen or been forced to exchange their duties and responsibilities so that each is now doing what the other used to do. So we oftentimes see this in younger adults and even teenagers who are taking care of a parent. When you think of a teenager, you think of a parent who is taking care of the teenager. But sometimes in certain families, maybe when the parent is diagnosed with cancer, the teenager has to take on more of a parental role to the parent. They have to take on more responsibilities. Um, and that can be really emotionally stressful, not only for the teenager, but also for the parent. But of course, you still do see this as well in, uh, you know, a caregiver who is, for instance, 50 and their parent who is perhaps 80. In addition, we also see the, uh, the challenge of communicating updates with family members. So particularly when there's a lot of siblings involved um, and the, uh, they're taking care of the parent, maybe uh, one sibling is trying to be the primary caregiver, but another sibling is trying to be the other primary caregiver, or maybe one sibling thought that they had XYZ responsibilities, but sibling number two thought that they had XYZ responsibilities. It can get really disorganized. It can get really stressful. And this is where fights break out. So that is definitely a massive challenge when we see a caregiver taking care of their parent, particularly when there are other family members uh, directly involved. And of course, as we saw in taking care of a partner, there are also these challenges in increased feelings of fear, increased feelings of resentment, changing family dynamics, as I was just mentioning. Uh, you may experience increased feelings of guilt. Maybe uh, you're thinking, um, wow, I really want to, or let's take it back to the example of the teenager, for instance. Maybe the teenager really wants to go off with their group of friends for the night. 
but they feel guilty. How can I leave my parent at home when they're dealing with these chemo side effects and I'm going to go out and enjoy myself? That may be a really heavy feeling to deal with. Um, it may bring on these extreme feelings of guilt, um, but you know, that is something that needs to be addressed because like the resentment piece, we don't want that to boil over. Guilt can lead to resentment. So it's important to identify when you're feeling guilty and, you know, kind of dive into it a little bit. Why are you feeling guilty? Is it so bad to prioritize yourself once in a blue moon? We'll talk about that later in future slides. Um, and of course, there are always challenges with engaging in self-care. Like I just mentioned, the inability to prioritize yourself. There is that isolation factor. And once again, there is that anticipatory grief factor. And last but not least, caring for a child. So we see the, um, the challenge of role reversal come to play. We also see the challenge of changing family dynamics and communicating updates with family members. But we also see this challenge of infantilization come up where, um, this particularly happens when a an older adult parent is taking care of an adult child. Um, that person, the caregiver, can start to uh, treat the cancer patient kind of like a child, um, a child who is younger than 18 years old. And uh, this can be really emotionally stressful, not only for the patient, but also for the caregiver, um, because it can bring on, again, those feelings of resentment. It can also uh, cause confusion and a lot of stress among other family members who are seeing this change and wondering why this change occurred. And um, it can create a lot of tension among family members, as I was just uh, mentioning. So that's another unique concept to communicating updates with family members. Um, and of course, those increased feelings of fear, increased feelings of guilt, challenges with engaging in self-care, isolation, and anticipatory grief. So let's talk about burnout. We've kind of been touching on, on that already, but let's talk uh, further in depth about it. So what is burnout? It's the state of mental and physical exhaustion. And it's also known as compassion fatigue. So uh, this can lead to feelings of guilt and anxiety, which can lead to poor health outcomes for both yourself and your loved one. So if you get stressed out, yes, you can have poor health outcomes. Uh, when you get stressed, your immune system uh, gets depleted and the two are correlated. And so that's why I say it's always important to prioritize yourself as the caregiver so that you can give back more to your loved one. But so what are the signs to look out for? How do I know that I'm experiencing burnout? There are so many, but some of the most common ones are prolonged feelings of sadness, helplessness, hopelessness, and or anxiety, anxiousness, feeling tired even after getting plenty of sleep, lack of interest in doing things or even lack of motivation, neglecting basic self-care getting sick more easily with the common cold or flu, as I just said, you have trouble concentrating, maybe you have impatience with the person you're caring for, and you may have changes in appetite. Maybe you're overeating, undereating, not getting enough nutrients. Um, so these are the, the biggest uh, signs of burnout that we see in caregivers and in patients as well. But what can cause this? What leads to it? So uh, confusion, lack of understanding of your role. Uh, for instance, let's bring it back to the example of there is multiple siblings taking care of a parent who has a cancer diagnosis. Maybe if you are trying to figure out if you are helping too much or helping too little, and maybe if you're being called out by your sibling on doing too much or doing too little, this can cause a lot of stress. And of course, stress leads to immunocompromisation. It can also lead to uh, feelings of sadness, anxiousness, depression, uh, neglecting basic self-care, everything that I mentioned in the previous slide. Perhaps your loved one has unrealistic expectations of, your, of you. Maybe they are asking too much of you. This can happen. 
And it can be accompanied with feelings of guilt because as the caregiver, you may be wondering why should, you know, I, I should be able to do all of this stuff. Um, you know, I'm not the one dealing with cancer. I really need to be stepping it up. You are more than welcome to say to your loved one, you know, hey, I don't think I can do all of this. Uh, let's see what we can prioritize. Let's see what we need to do in order to ensure that your needs are being met, but that I'm not getting burned out. Maybe you feel like you have a lack of control. This kind of goes more into the emotional piece. Um, when a cancer diagnosis surfaces, the biggest emotional challenge that a lot of people see or social workers see or therapists see is the idea of, well, I can't control the cancer and therefore everything in my life is uncontrollable. And therefore... Uh, nothing can be controlled, and this leads to hopelessness, lack of motivation, etc. So it's important, um, particularly in your own therapy practice. And if you haven't gone to therapy or counseling, I highly recommend that you do trying in group, trying individual one on one, is to think about the things that you do have control of. It's starting with as simple of a thing as, for instance, do you have control of uh, what time you wake up tomorrow morning? Absolutely. Do you have control of taking a shower that day? Absolutely. Those seem so mundane, but it really is putting one foot in front of the other and really honing in on the things that you have a lot of control over. Um, the unrealistic demands kind of tie in with unrealistic expectations. And again, this goes back to having open and honest, calm conversations. In addition, it's important to remember to think about how, how what you are going to say is going to be received. I know that maybe a lot of us have heard this expression where if you're having like a really tough conversation with your loved one, it's important to say things like, I feel this instead of saying, you are making me do this, because that's going to sound a little aggressive. But when you say, I feel this when this happens, it's going to be received a lot better. Um, lack of self-care definitely leads to burnout as well. I see time and time again, caregivers put off their basic medical appointments because they, they feel like they don't have time. And perhaps you don't have time, but it's important to remember that you need to prioritize your own basic health care so that you can be at your best for your loved one. If you put off your own health care, it's going to be more difficult to take care of your loved one if you don't get the proper help, if you don't get the proper medications. Inability to prioritize yourself. Um, this is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, you have you perhaps may be feeling very isolated. I'm the only one in the world who is going through this. And you absolutely are going through a unique experience, but you're not alone. You're not alone. There are so many blogs, support groups, um, so many other platforms that can show you that you're absolutely not alone in this caregiving process. And last but not least, displaced or projected anger. Um, perhaps you have a lot of sadness, frustration, anger, resentment, anxiousness that you may be putting on to someone or taking it out on someone. And that's not healthy both for you and that's not healthy for your friendships and your uh, and your uh, family members. Okay, so now that I've gone into depth about what causes burnout and all of the stressors and challenges, let's talk about what we can do with this information. Reach out for support. Um, absolutely. 110% reach out for support. I promise you, you are not the only one in the world who is dealing with this. And <clears throat> maybe if you don't want to talk with other people who are in a similar position, maybe you want to talk with someone one-on-one -on -one who gives you an objective opinion, who can hear you out, who can give you practical tools in order to cope. So that's where individual counseling comes in, finding a counselor who can help you out through this difficult time. But maybe you do want to feel less isolated and you'd rather talk with other people who are going through the same situation as you are. That's where group counseling comes into play. Maybe you want the 
a type of group counseling, talking with someone who's been in a similar position as you, but perhaps you want to just talk with one person. You don't want it to be very overwhelming. That's where peer matching comes in. Um, I love to refer people to the organizations called Fourth Angel and Immerman Angels. Um, those are great peer matching organizations. You sign up, you tell them exactly what you're looking for, and they will match you with someone who um, has been in your situation that can kind of act as a mentor towards you. You can attend educational workshops such as this one. Um, there are so many other educational workshops out there provided by uh, cancer-focused organizations, um, such as the one that I work for called Cancer Care, but there are also disease-specific organizations like Longevity for lung cancer patients or the Triple Negative Breast Cancer Foundation for Triple Negative Breast Cancer patients, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, stuff like that. Um, if you don't know where to start, connect with your medical team. Ask to speak with a hospital social worker because they will have emotional support for you. And if they don't, they can certainly refer you to someone in the area who can help. And of course, you can also talk with a nurse navigator and a patient advocate who can help guide you through uh, getting set up with necessary resources. And of course, there are caregiver-focused organizations. Uh, these are just a few uh, out of the many, many, many that are out there. Um, My Cancer Circle and Lots of Helping Hands are truly fantastic. I believe that they have a partnership with each other. But the reason why I like to always call them out is because a lot of the times caregivers um, will tell me that they have a really difficult time with organizing and giving people tasks and responsibilities um, to do or just reaching out for assistance, like even for just a meal to be made that night. Lots of helping hands slash my cancer circle has this really great tool where you can put a calendar on your profile and only those who you invite, your close friends and family, only those will have access to your profile and they'll be able to see where on the calendar they can help out. Maybe on Tuesday night, you need someone to bring Billy to soccer practice. Someone can sign up for that. Maybe on a Saturday, um, someone needs to take um, your girlfriend to get her blood work done to set up her chemo appointment for Monday. So maybe someone can bring her there. Uh, maybe you just need a meal. They can sign up for that. It's a really, really great and unique tool. And of course, practice self-care. And if you don't know where to start, these are just a few of the many ways um, in which you can start practicing basic self-care. Stay active and move your body. You do not have to run a marathon. In fact, don't. <laughs> you probably don't have the time and you probably don't have the energy. If you do, fantastic. But if not, no problem. Don't sweat it. I'm even talking about something as simple as stretching. Take a stretching class. Go on YouTube. Take a five-minute stretch class. Maybe take a 20-minute chair yoga class. So easy, so simple. It'll get you to move your body. Eat a balanced diet. Uh, speak to a nutritionist or a dietitian if you don't know where to start. Practice good sleep hygiene. What's sleep hygiene? Well, like basic hygiene is putting on deodorant or maybe taking a bath uh, or a shower. Sleep hygiene is kind of the same thing, but we're thinking more, mostly about sleep. How can you get the best possible sleep so that you can be your best possible self? So sleep hygiene consists of things like don't look at your phone or the TV right before bed. Uh, sleep in a cool environment. Put on white noise if you have to. Uh, sleep in comfortable fitting clothes. Anything that you can do to get a good night's sleep. Utilize your support system. A lot of the times caregivers and patients alike will tell me in practice, you know, I don't want to burden anyone. No one, I, I really, you know, no one can really help me. It's really okay. And to that, I say, how do you know? How do you know? Um, it's, you know, it's so important to remember that a lot of times people maybe don't know how to help. And so you kind of need to tell them. And I know that this seems so um, difficult. Like, how can I possibly be telling someone what to do with their time? But at the same time, more than likely, they really do want to help. And to, you know, if you're still having, um, or excuse me, if you're still struggling with this concept, 
I invite you to put yourself in their shoes. What if they were in your position? Would you be, uh, you know, just dismissing them if they asked for help? Probably not. So just remember that your loved ones most likely want to help you. Keep up to date with your own medications and appointments. As I mentioned in a previous slide, if you skip your own doctor's appointments or if you skip your own medical appointments, how can you show up 100% for your loved one? Because maybe something is going to go unseen, unmedicated, unnoticed, and it may become even more of uh, an issue later on if it's not de you know, detected early or addressed early. Please go to your doctor's appointments. Set boundaries, you know, create and manage expectations and what's required of you. It's absolutely okay as a caregiver to say to your loved one, you know, I can't do this one thing with you tonight because I actually need to go out with a friend. I need to get away a little bit. I'm really sorry. Um, <clears throat> you need to set those boundaries so that you create um, you create a healthy balance uh, between caregiving and also moving to, moving forward with your life. You're not moving on. You're moving forward. Do you see the difference? Moving forward means that you're still maintaining your quality of life. You're still maintaining your life, uh, the little aspects of joy in your life, while also making sure that you're showing up and you're present for your loved one. On that, uh, on that kind of same wavelength, if you will, I always like saying, say yes to yourself and say no to others. It's not selfish. This is not a selfish act. You're going to show up even more so for your loved one if you say yes to yourself and maybe say no to something that your loved one or maybe even someone else is asking you to do. Maybe, for instance, your friend group is saying, hey, come out with us today. Come out to lunch. No, I'm sorry. I can't. I need to actually take a 30-minute nap instead. That's fine. That's looking out for yourself. You're creating healthy boundaries. And perhaps if you want to step outside the house, but you're physically not able to do so because your loved one needs a higher attention of care, ask for respite care. Ask the neighbor, hey, can you uh, be with my loved one for an hour? Ask a sibling. Ask a friend. Ask another family member. You never know. Uh, perhaps maybe your loved one can stay at home, but maybe they are of higher needs. So just make sure you have your phone on loud and they have their phone on loud. Create uh, text check-ins. I'm going to text you every 30 minutes to check in. If you do not let me know that you're okay, I will come back. Practice patience, kindness, and self-compassion towards others and also towards yourself. Be patient with yourself. I have seen so many caregivers be so hard on their themselves and create expectations of themselves that they cannot abide by. Be patient with yourself. Put one foot in front of the other. Go slow. This is okay. It's the new normal. And last but not least, check in with yourself. Uh, if you feel like you are running on 10% battery, take a step back, check in with yourself. Why are you feeling this way? How can we alleviate this? And then if you're more so into the mindfulness exercises, the grounding techniques, these are just a few ways in which you can start your practice. So I really love box breathing, and there are so many ways in which you can do this. So people love a 444 count. Other people love a 478 count. Okay, Dina, what does that mean? I will explain. So when you think of a box, you think of, uh, you know, four sides, of course. And when you think of each side, if you're tracing each side of the box, you're going to think of one side as breathing in, the other side holding the breath, breathing out for the other side, holding, and then breathing in again. You want to go in through your nose, out through your mouth. So let's say we're just doing a simple 444. You breathe in through your nose for four counts, four long counts. You hold the breath for four counts. You exhale for four counts through your through your uh, through your mouth. Pause for four counts. Repeat. 
uh, you can find a script to follow along for this on YouTube. Very, very easy. There's also lots of different ways in which you can meditate. I myself love a good body scan. And again, you can find a great script on YouTube. A body scan is when uh, the person who is guiding you helps you identify each part of your body and makes you focus in on each part of your body and how each part of your body is feeling. But they don't just cover head, shoulders, knees, and toes. They will cover certain parts of your body that you would never think about. How does your forehead feel right now? How do the tips of your ears feel right now? How about the back of your neck? How about your kneecaps? How about your pinky toes? They will focus in on very particular body parts and focusing in on how those specific body parts feel will make you feel more present and therefore more grounded. Like you're not flying away with your anxiousness. Guided imagery guides you through a peaceful image that you can visualize. Uh, you'll find a lot of visualizations such as floating on a cloud, sitting on a beach, sitting in a meadow, walking through a forest. Loving kindness meditation is also a great one. This focuses in on gratitude. And again, because this is recorded, uh, this presentation is recorded, I really um, invite everyone here to remember all of these things or go back to all of these things, type them into YouTube or into Google, and you will come up with guided uh, body scans, guided imagery, loving kindness meditations, so that you can access all this great information for free. And then on some other mindfulness activities that you can do um, without even a computer or a smartphone are mindful walks. So thinking about uh, putting one foot in front of the other, what does it feel like? How does the ground feel like? What are you observing around you? Being very intent, um, intentional with your walk. Same as mindful eating. Uh, we did a great, I, you know, I took a mindfulness course and we did this great uh, mindful eating exercise where someone brought in like Hershey's Kisses and they asked us to chew on the Hershey's Kisses for two minutes straight and focus in on every single detail involved in the Hershey's Kiss. It's a great activity. I highly recommend you do it with a specific food that you feel comfortable eating, of course. There's the five, th four, three, two, one technique. Um, this covers all of the senses. What are five things you can see? What are four things you can hear? What are three things you can taste, et cetera, et cetera. Feet grounding technique, putting two feet on the ground and focusing in on how your feet feel, particularly on the ground. This is another great way, um, great exercise that you can practice, particularly when you feel out of control. And journaling. Journaling doesn't have to be every night for an hour, writing pages and pages and pages. It can it can be as simple as write three in three bullet points what you feel grateful for that happened that day. In the morning, write three bullet points, three things that you're grateful for just in general. Write three great things that you were happy about that day. Very, very easy. Very, very simple. A lot of times people uh, are very intimidated by mindfulness practices, but I, I highly recommend them because there is something for everyone and you will surprise yourself on what can work um, or even what doesn't work for you. So get curious, get creative, go online. There are so many way, uh, so many platforms that you can find that are free and that all, will also be very, very helpful. And these are just a few helpful resources that I want to conclude with here because um, each of them provides a lot of helpful information, not only to caregivers, but also to patients. I put my organization at the at the top because I'm biased. Uh, cancer care, um, you know, go on our website. It's very user friendly. We have so much information there. Uh, we also, uh, or excuse me, I love looking at the Caregiver Action Network, the Family Caregiver Alliance, and the National Alliance for Caregiving. Those are fantastic websites, particularly for caregivers. I mentioned my cancer circle and lots of helping hands. 
I also mentioned those disease specific organizations. Um, so if we're thinking about blood cancers, I, you know, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, they are a fantastic organization. But, um, you know, if you're here today and uh, you have loved ones who have uh a type of cancer beyond blood cancer, Google, you never know what you're going to find. I mean, there is the National Pancreatic uh, Cancer Network, there's Longevity, there's Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network, there's Triple Negative Breast Cancer Foundation, there's the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. I can name so many. So just Google, see what you can find. And last but not least, meditation apps. So if you don't want to go on YouTube and you don't want to get lost in the world of YouTube, these two apps are fantastic ways in which you can introduce yourself to the meditation world. Uh, I love the Headspace app, particularly because they have three-minute exercises. Three minutes. That's all. They also have nice visuals if you're more of a visual learner. So whether you're auditory or visual, both are great. And last but not least, um, I do want to hone in on cancer care services in particular. Um, as I said, I'm biased. We're a great organization. I'm so glad that Health Tree reached out to us. Um, but these are just some of the many services that we provide. Um, we do offer limited forms of financial assistance and copay assistance. Um, we also offer uh online group counseling for people nationwide. And if you're joining us today and you're from New York or New Jersey, we do have live one-on-one -on -one and group support available. We have helpful connect education workshops and coping circle workshops. Um, they dive in a little bit more on like the uh, educational piece, such as um, inviting in doctors and nurses to talk about treatment updates. But we also have the more wellness side to it, where social workers will come in and talk about specific wellness topics to uh, different populations. In addition, we have case management services, which we refer to as resource navigation. We have a lot of helpful articles, publications, and we actually have a podcast. It's called Cancer Out Loud. Uh, I believe you can access this on um, many different podcast platforms, but actually we have them all on our website so that you can go back to any one of them. It's free. And uh, with that, I thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I hope you learned something, but I'm here to answer any questions. Um, Mary, how do you wanna go about the uh, asking questions today? Yeah. So first, thank you for that incredible presentation. I learned a lot and I feel like there's a lot to be taken away from this last hour. So for questions, as a reminder, you can enter them in the chat and then I can read them um, and we can answer them that way. Or if you want to verbally ask your question, you can use the react button and raise your hand and then you can ask your question verbally. So um Let's see. I had some people asking questions to me directly about the peer matching organizations that you mentioned, wanting a little bit more information on those. And I will say at HealthTree, we have a coaching program for our myeloma and our AML patients. And the coaches are truly incredible. And it's a one-on-one -on -one peer mentorship program. Um, you can match with someone who has a background similar to yours or who is doing um, same treatments as you, has the same disease as you, and you can stay with that person for as long as you'd like to match with them. So if you have AML or myeloma, I'd love to help get people connected to that. But for patients on the call who maybe are in one of those programs with HealthTree, um, if you wanted to talk about the organizations you mentioned just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the organizations such as like uh like Emmerman's Angels, I think you mentioned. Oh, those, yeah. Absolutely. Like what those are and yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I it's called Immerman Angels. So that's I M E R M A N Angels. It, sorry guys, it's late in the day for me here on the East Coast. <laughs> and then the other one is called Fourth Angel. So just the number four and an angel. Um, they, all they do is peer matching. Okay. Um, so 
basically, then this is really good for people who uh, maybe have like disease specific questions or maybe feel like, gosh, I'm the only person in the world who is experiencing this and wants to feel less isolated, but doesn't really want to dip their toes into the group counseling world. This is a great organization. Uh, those are two great uh, organizations to find peer matching. So you'll go to them, you'll have an interview, but basically it's not like a, you know, tell us why you would be a good fit for us. No, no, no. It's more so like, just tell us what you're looking for and they'll match you. And you can be with your mentor for as long as you want. You can even switch mentors. Maybe you don't like the first one that you're with. That's totally okay. So you can switch. Um, I've heard a lot of great feedback from a lot of my clients who have um, gone to both organizations. And of course, you know, Health Tree, this is great. You know, they have that coaching uh, service that is a great thing as well. I know that a lot of disease specific uh, platforms have it too. Um, Be Beacon, Bladder Cancer Action Network, they have a great peer matching program. So, um, you know, just do a little bit of Google searching and see what you can find. There's a lot out there. Thank you for that. I think, you know, that one on one connection with another person going through something similar to you is such a valuable resource especially if you don't know anyone else that has cancer or is caring for somebody else with cancer. So I think I'm glad that you highlighted that as a, as an important resource. Let's see. I'm not seeing any other patient or caregiver questions in the chat right now. Um, but something I thought of as you were speaking, um, kind of towards the beginning, you were talking about the, um, what was it called? Compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do, there's a lot of guilt that goes with that, I would imagine. And I know we kind of talked overall about, you know, overcoming feelings of guilt and things like that. But when it comes to that specific type of compassion fatigue, what are some ways that you've seen are helpful for people to kind of overcome that or to accept that and be able to move forward? Yeah. So I think, I think the first thing to identify, I know I talked a lot about um, feelings of guilt in this presentation. A lot of times people ha have this idea of what a caregiver should do or look like or feel like. And a lot of the times we envision this person being stoic and being a superhero and being able to work off of two hours of sleep and uh, be happy as a clam all the time and be able to run a mile a minute and be super organized. And let's face it, that's not it. I have never met a caregiver who can do all of that. And that's okay. That's fine. Um, we as humans are born to feel. So a lot of the times we, you know, as we are running through the motions of caregiving while also keeping up with our basic day-to-day -day tasks and responsibilities, we start to get very run down. And in the process, we start to have those thoughts creep into our mind of, oh, well, if only they didn't have the cancer, well, oh, they could be able to help out. Well, Ugh, I can't believe that like they're complaining about muscle aches again. You know, all these little thoughts start creeping into our mind that start to make us feel very resentful of our loved one and just make us a little less compassionate. Um, and it's at those moments that that's why I tell you, check in with yourself, be patient and really identify what's going on there. Why are those uh, thoughts creeping in all of a sudden? Um, is this a sign of burnout? Do you need to take a step back? Um, it's a very real thing. And so that's why it's important always to check in with yourself because we don't th want that resentment to boil over into an explosive argument into something that you'll regret. Thank you. We have a question from one of our community members, Pat. We'll go ahead and take your question now. Hi, I'm on Steve's, uh, my husband's computer. I don't know how to use it. I'm used to hitting it <laughs> um, and I have to use the mouse. Uh, I thought your presentation was excellent, Dina. I I experienced everything you talked about as a caregiver. Um, 15 years ago, I had kidney cancer along with my sister. She was in New York and I was here at, in Durham 
So I attended Duke and she was unwilling or she just couldn't really talk about it and because she got it six months before I did. And Duke had a caregiving support group and I never went to it. And I totally regret that. You know, I think it would have been very helpful for me. Um, and I think it would have been helpful for me as two years ago when Steve got AML leukemia. Um, if I had found someone else I could talk to, you know, like what was I going to go through now? I've done everything you've, you, I mean, I exercise, I meditate every night. I, I go see a counselor every two weeks and it's all helped. I mean, the first year was really hard. Had I done it earlier, well, I was always exercising, but I talked to someone earlier, it would have been more helpful. But anyway, you were right on in everything you said. So thank you and continue to help the caregivers of America. Thanks so much, Pat. Yeah. And, um, you know, I feel for you and your sister and your husband. Um, yeah, it can, it, it, you know, you might be do, doing all the right things, exercising, eating right, getting good sleep. And it might sometimes not feel like enough, um, which is why I always encourage people, you know, if you feel alone, if you feel like you just don't know what to do at that point, uh, reach out for help reach out for help. I'm so glad that, you know, you got something out of this presentation um, yes, because excellent. it's, you know, I'm hoping that like today I can do what I did for you for a lot of other people. You know, I'm hoping a lot of other people today said, I feel this way too. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that I can normalize a lot of emotions for a lot of people today, but thank you for your comment. You're welcome. And then my colleague had a question sent to her in the chat, so she'll ask that one now. Um, we have a question that says, one thing we're struggling with is how to help our friends understand the needs of chronic cancer for the patient and the caregiver. My husband looks healthy, so everyone kind of forgets. We never can. How to help them remember to care and check in with us? Hmm. Great question. That is a great question. And I oftentimes see that challenge a lot. I'm sure that a lot of people here have uh, been met with the question or the comment, well, your loved one looks great. You look great. You don't look sick. Oh, wow. They don't look sick. That can be very invalidating. It can be very invalidating, particularly when you're dealing with a uh, blood cancer or something that, you know, you do not, or maybe a specific uh, type of cancer that requires a specific type of treatment that doesn't make you lose your hair or doesn't make you lose weight. Uh, but again, so hearing that can feel very invalidating. So I always remind caregivers um, that yes, you should not have to reach out. I hope for every single caregiver out there that they have a support system who will go the extra mile and just do whatever they have to do without being told. Unfortunately, that does not happen a lot. I don't know why. But to those people, I say, never hesitate to ask for exactly what you need. Because think about it. If you have a good friend and they were going through the exact situation as you were going through, what would you do? If they were asking for help, what would you do? More than likely, you would pay it forward. You would help. They also probably don't know what to do, or maybe they're under the mindset of they'll reach out if they need help. So it's oftentimes good to just kind of create that bridge um, and just say, listen, I'm really feeling stressed out. I know that this seems so simple, but do you mind just, you know, uh, making me a lasagna and putting it on my doorstep this evening? I, I don't have time to cook and I don't have the money to order in. So easy. So set, state exactly what you need help with and when you need it and just show the distress and the um, stress that you're going through. More than likely, they will be willing and wanting to help. Thank you for that answer. I think that is a great reminder that, you know, hopefully, like you said, people are being proactive, reaching out to you, but sometimes stating specifically what you need so that people can meet the exact need you have right then is 
a big resource that people miss out on because you just don't want to feel like a burden. Um, but like you said, if you turn it in your head and you think about someone reaching out to you, you would much rather someone reach out to you than feel alone. So expect and hope that that's how your community and your support system feels. Um, we have one last question in the chat before we'll go ahead and close since we are right at time. Um, and maybe if you have a quick resource and if not, we can give this person some resources afterwards. But the question was how to break the news of diagnosis to family. Is there like an easier way to do that? That's a great question. Um, the right way is your way. Um, I have, um, I have talked with patients before who have decided to tell one person in their family. And to that, I say, fantastic. You know, you decide who you want to tell, you decide who you want help from. Um, if you are, have decided, okay, I want to tell all of my family members, I just don't know how to do it. Um, make sure that you feel good enough about sharing the information so that you can feel confident in answering any questions because more than likely they will have questions. Also just be prepared for a lot of emotions, a lot of emotions, but just remember that you do not have to hold space for them. You know, if, if they're crying is too much for you, that's okay. That's okay. You can, you can say, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry. I, this is just a lot for me right now. And, and you can create space. Um, if you want to be there for, if they have a lot of emotions, fantastic. But remember that you're telling them is your journey and you can do it in the way that you want to do it because there's no right or wrong way. The right way is your way. Thank you so much. And thank you again, just overall for the presentation today and for your answers to all of our questions. I think, as you can see, this is a resource that I think is, there's, it's lacking for caregivers. And I'm glad that we were able to provide a little bit of some answers and some support, some community for people who are caregiving. Uh, as we finish today, I just want to remind um, that you'll be given a two to three minute survey as you leave the webinar today. We would love to hear your feedback on today's topic. And if you have any other topics you'd like us to cover, you'll be given a place to enter those there. So please fill that out and let us know kind of what you thought about today so that we can make our future events better and make sure to cover other topics that you're interested in. We have a lot of people from a lot of different of our cancer communities in here today. So I wanted to give just a quick update of some of the events that we have coming up. We have, um, yeah, lots of different diseases with events. So we have on Monday, October 29th, an event for our CLL community on things to think about when choosing a chronic lymphocytic leukemia treatment. On Monday, October 29th, we also have an event for our DLBCL and follicular lymphoma community on CAR T therapy and stem cell transplant. On October 30th, we have an event for our myelofibrosis community on to treat or not to treat. On Tuesday, October 30th, our Black Myeloma Health Chapter will have an event on understanding multiple myeloma clinical trials, observational versus interventional studies. And then on Monday, November 5th, we'll have an all blood cancer event on financial education, estate and legacy planning for blood cancer patients. All of these are really exciting. And as you can see, there's lots going on and there's more still to be finalized and um, sent out. So keep an eye on the newsletters that come out to you for all of the events going on in your specific disease communities. The link to sign up for those is at the bottom of this slide. And then the that link and all of the resources that we've mentioned today will be available in our follow-up email that will go out without within 48 hours after we end this event today. Again, I'd like to thank all of our amazing sponsors um, for their help and for their support, which allows us to all do what we do here and put on events like this. The sponsors are Pfizer, Regeneron, Johnson & Johnson, GSK, Cario Farm, Bristol-Myers Squibb, AbbVie, Sanofi, Adaptive, and Genentech. And then finally, I just want to end uh, with saying thank you for all of your help in helping us to build our Health Tree community. I've added my email to this slide, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about Health Tree in general, questions that linger from today's presentation or any of our programs. I'm happy to help connect you to resources and answer any of those questions. 
I appreciate all of you and I hope you all have a great rest of your day and hope to see you at one of our future webinars soon.